Welcome back 2021ers. This is Professor Kaufman and we will be continuing our discussion of the memory system in this lecture. A few logistics announcements. Be having a look at chapter six of Brian and O'Halloran. They go into a good deal of detail on the memory system and we'll be picking out parts of that to focus on, but generally most of the information that's present in there is important for our cause at the moment. Our goals for the remainder of today are to continue the discussion of 2D arrays and relate that actually to one dimensional timing issues uh, that you'll see and expand on this phenomena of there being sort of different times associated with accessing memory. Uh, this will eventually, once we complete our discussion of the memory system, enable us to write memory efficient programs or at least as efficient as possible. You'll want to have a wrap up soon of homework nine on timing these low level loops that were illustrating aspects of the pipelined and superscalar effects that you'll see in modern processors. Uh, expect a lab and a homework this week that will start to discuss aspects of timing in memory operations and how to optimize so that memory operations are efficient. These both uh, will be used in uh, project four, which you ex should expect to come out uh, later this week. So we left off last time with this discussion of perf results, and we were particularly interested in timing a matrix algorithm, a simple one that simply goes across rows and totals all the uh, elements that are present in the matrix and reports that sum, versus instead of going across rows, going down columns. And what we observed is that going across rows uh, yielded very good performance, uh, less time to execute up here, uh, more instructions per cycle, and down here, the column-wise version took longer and generated fewer instructions per clock cycle. And we attributed this mainly to the unfavorable miss rate. Uh, down here, uh, this L1 decache, whatever that is, uh, featured a lot of misses versus a lot of hits associated with the row-wise version. We're going to have to make that somewhat more concrete, but it should prickle your interest just a little bit uh, that there's uh, just a subtle change in loop ordering here uh, that would go down columns instead gets me this worse statistic and worse performance generally. We won't necessarily see this just in two dimensional cases uh, that instead we're going to talk about a one dimensional case where this phenomena is also apparent. So you turn your eyes over to the following code that's present in your code pack in a file called stridethroughput.c, along with a few other things that are interesting that we'll talk about. But generally, we'll focus for the moment on the following function uh, called sum simple. There's a global array called data. It's full of integers, and this function sums up some of those and returns uh, that sum to whoever's calling. The one important parameter that's associated with this function that we'll turn our attention to mostly is the stride parameter. Certainly, as is always the case in C, you need a length parameter to say how big is the array. Generally, we'll just presume that for all calls, the length is the same, uh, that we're uh, adding up a big array of some kind. Uh, but instead, we're going to vary how many of the elements in that array we add up based on the stride parameter. And you can see its use down here in the loop as the loop variable i, its increment uh, quantity. So for a stride of one, I'm going to be going by ones through this array, adding all of the array up uh, into sum, versus a stride of two is only going to visit elements 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., the even elements, uh, totaling only half of the array. You go up to a stride of three, you're looking at a third of the elements in the array being added at indices 0, 3, 6, 9, etc., uh, and four and five and six, uh, further reducing the amount of the array that contributes to the sum, taking bigger steps through it. So with this knowledge then that the stride, uh, this parameter down here, controls how big of a step you uh, take uh, through the loops, we'd be interested in comparing the results of different strides. Certainly you'd expect to have different sums as in more if I'm adding up uh, more of the array. Uh, so we'll want to compare these in some sort of fair way. Uh, first and foremost, I need to measure the total time this took, and this will ask you to recall some functions that we talked about earlier, uh, which allow you to time a portion of the code. Uh, so how long does it take to sum up this entire array with a stride of one versus how long does it take to sum up the entire array with a stride of two and a stride of three and so forth. It should be intuitively apparent that generally you expect the time to go down as the stride increases. If I'm only adding up half of the array, I expect that that should take less time than adding up the whole array. In truth, though, what we'll really be most interested in is the throughput uh, for this function. 
For instance, if I add up the whole array and then add up uh, using a stride of two half of the array, do I expect that to take half the time? Throughput is a fair way to measure these. It's how many additions did you do divided by the amount of time you took or a measure of additions per second, more or less. To that end, we'll want to calculate what this throughput is for a variety of different strides and compare it. You'll want to pump out some code to do that, and that's your exercise for the moment, uh, to measure the total time and the throughput uh, for this, uh, so provide, uh, provide some code. But more importantly, assess whether or not you believe uh, the total time and throughput, how are they going to change as these uh, strides increase? Do you expect that throughput will stay the same, as in adding up half the array takes half the time? Or do you expect it to be different in some way, perhaps improving or getting worse, and if so, why? If you can, relate this back to our earlier discussion of different ways of adding up the matrices, going by rows versus columns. What does stride pertain to in that case? We'll pick up in just a second, so I'll give you a chance to pause, and then we'll resume. All right, spoilers ahead. Of course we're talking about this because throughput is going to change as the stride changes. And to calculate that, you'd probably use something like the clock function that we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, this test function here, it uh, should be renamed uh, later on to this uh, sum simple part, uh, but there are a couple different test functions that I experimented with. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but first, you just call the function with a, a particular slide. Uh, immediately before it, start the clock ticking, uh, or figure out what the CPU time is, rather, uh, and then stop the clock, or figure out what the CPU time is afterwards. That gives you a uh, stop and start time that allows you, according to the formula we used to saw earlier, uh, to do a little arithmetic, uh, which will allow you to then calculate the total CPU time in real units, uh, CPU uh, clocks, uh, or sorry, uh, seconds, uh, rather, CPU time in seconds. Uh, and that further, with a little arithmetic, would allow you to uh, calculate what the throughput is. It's just how many additions you did. Divide that by the stride, so stride of two, you're dividing by half here. Stride of three, uh, divide the length by a third. Uh, divide that by CPU time, and you have then the throughput in additions done per second. So interestingly, what you'll tend to see is that as the stride increases, the throughput decreases. And here's a plot on a particular system. I can't remember if it's my laptop or my desktop that I did some time ago, but uh, on the bottom axis is the stride. So as I go forwards and now of the x-axis, I'm getting bigger and bigger strides, up to 5, 10, 15, up to 30 over here. And along the y-axis is my throughput in additions per second. You can see that this has a very nice curve to it, that uh, as I increase uh, the stride, I get sort of... Uh, decreasing uh, in a, uh, let's see, what's the word for it? An asymptotically sort of approaching some minimum stride uh, down here that we bottom out around 30 or so, um, uh, or a stride of 30 or so. Uh, so to that end, we'd want to explore why it is and what hardware features actually lead to this uh, particular curve. And, but importantly, you should always be aware of this and uh, that the bigger strides that you take in memory, uh, the worse your throughput is generally going to be. Uh, and that's if I go from a stride of one to two, I don't take half as much time. I instead take something more like, you know, three quarters of the time I did for to add up everything. Uh, and that means that uh, if you're interested in skipping around in memory, you can expect that uh, your performance is going to suffer in some way. This one-dimensional curve that's present over there is actually present in other spots. Uh, and the pictures that you see on this slide uh, should be vaguely familiar to you. Uh, they are, in fact, the pictures that show up on the cover of Brian O'Halloran's textbook. And they refer to this thing more or less as a memory mountain. Uh, now, it takes a little bit of work maybe to see where those one-dimensional curves, uh, this nice little thing, fits into this picture. And so uh, I'm going to blow up this thing just a little bit to focus on one part of it uh, quickly. Uh, let me get a full screen there. And here, that should get us down here. So if you look carefully at this part, uh, this sort of outermost edge of this three-dimensional plot, uh, this should relate back to the curve that we were just looking at. Uh, a moment ago, we had something on that looked like this guy. Now, uh, this sort of nice high and then gradually lower, uh, fractionally lower until it sort of bottoms out. That's the same curve that appears uh, down over here. 
Um, uh, the reason that uh, you can sort of see that here is that uh, the 3D plot that you're looking at is measuring almost exactly the same things that we are if you take a, a two-dimensional slice of this. Uh, and that uh, the stride is along this, uh, I'll call it the x-axis here, and uh, the y-axis, I'll call this uh, to line up with it, uh, that is the read throughput of reading through and summing on things. Uh, Brian and Howland use a very similar um, a code. We'll look at that in just a second. At any rate, uh, this one-dimensional, uh, sort of two-dimensional plot, though, is expanded uh, backwards by increasing the size of the array uh, that you have. And in truth, uh, the farthest back over here, this is where you have the smallest arrays, uh, sized like 32,000 uh, uh, some elements uh, in the array. And as you move forwards, the array gets progressively bigger, 128,000, 512,000, 2 million or so. What you will notice here then is that if you hold the size of the array fixed, you see that one dimensional curve all over the place. Uh, at times it's a little flatter, for instance, up here or up here, uh, but generally in lots of spots here, uh, this, one di or this two dimensional curve exists for a fixed size array. Uh, you also see then as you increase uh, the size of the array, uh, but hold the stride fixed, you get these interesting other curves here. For instance, holding stride of one, uh, you get the best performance up here, and then sort of a flat region along here uh, for a wider range of sizes from like 512,000 up to uh, a, so two or four million here. And then another significant drop over here uh, that's associated with very, very large arrays, 132 million, 128 million, et cetera. So this memory mountain uh, is essentially designed to demonstrate a bunch of different properties in terms of performance of uh, what the real systems uh, exhibit as you visit memory in different patterns. Uh, and you can see there are effects based both on the stride, uh, those are fairly uniform across different sizes of arrays, and also effects that you notice as you increase the array size that are sort of more marked drops uh, going from tiny arrays up here uh, to mid-size arrays to very big arrays uh, down here. So these memory mountains are interesting uh, and are measured in much the same way that uh, we did. Uh, the only sort of caveat is that you'd create this two-dimensional curve for some sized array like 10,000, and then you'd maybe double the size of that array to 20,000, remeasure and get a different set of times, uh, and then link them all together in some fancy plotting thing. Uh, although I think this was just in Microsoft to sell Excel. Uh, you get pretty looking stuff there that's colored based on how high up uh, things are. Um, so this uh, measurement that was done by Brian and Halloran, uh, it was done on a Core i5, it's an Intel processor, uh, that at the time of measuring was of reasonable girth. Uh, and over here is a similar plot for a very different processor, uh, a Raspberry Pi 3B, uh, measured around two, uh, 2016. It's an ARM processor, uh, and uh, these ARM processors, I think there's a variant of them called Cortex, and they have a bunch of different model numbers associated with that. You can see similar looking curves over here, uh, although you can see the characterization of for small to large arrays is very different. There are much smaller drops down over here. Uh, now, lest you get a little bit misled here, it's important to maybe zoom out for just a second uh, and center this so we can compare these two. Uh, the naive viewer of these things would look at this and say, wow, like the performance in terms of the ARM Cortex processor uh, seems really good, as in there isn't this big steep drop uh, as I move from uh, smallish arrays uh, to uh, biggish arrays uh, down over here. Uh, I get, still get better, like about the same performance over here. And combined with the price of the Raspberry Pi, which has traditionally been about $30 to $35 versus several hundred dollars just for the processor associated with uh, this Intel chip, uh, you might be inclined to go out and pick up your Raspberry Pi uh, for 30 bucks. Uh, but you'd probably be disappointed uh, if you actually did a fair comparison between these two. And if you look carefully, you'll see why. It has to do with the scale of these two charts, which is uh, committing one of the uh, sins that statisticians hate the most and that uh, these two things are scaled so they have a similar height but if you look at the scale values uh, 5,000 versus 35,000 there's a big difference there that this entire chart associated with Raspberry Pi would fit down in the lowest rungs of this uh, Intel chip and this is why you pay several hundred dollars more uh, to get an Intel chip is that you get better performance and one of the kinds of better performance you get is better memory throughput.
Now, the reason for the big jaggedness here uh, versus the very tiny drops over here have to do with cache size. Cache, as we introduced earlier, is this spot where the processor will store some copies of what's in main memory, but it'll store it closer on the processor chip itself in some reservoir of memory that's fast, uh, but tiny compared to the size of main memory. On that front, then, the, ra uh, the Raspberry, High, uh, Raspberry Pi has very little cache. Uh, you can see a little dip here. It's indicative of parts of this array will fit in cache, but then I run out of space and start having to hit main memory uh, as I get to larger and larger chunks there. Versus one of the reasons that the Intel chip is faster is that it has substantial size caches in several layers. Uh, the L1 cache probably fits the entirety or almost the entirety of this uh, 32,000 element array in it. Uh, versus if I get much bigger than that, I start having to go out to outer layers of cache, perhaps L2 and L3 cache. Uh, and at the point that I get a very large array that's, you know, multiple megabytes big, this is too big to fit in the cache system of the processor in its entirety. So you see a significant drop as uh, you have to start fetching parts of the array from main memory, uh, which hurts performance quite a bit. And so part of the lesson here is that if your processor has a big cache in it, you can expect better performance generally, so long as you are not taking big jumps through memory. Because you can see uh, the bigger your jumps, the faster you get this degradation uh, and exhaust parts of cache. Versus if your processor doesn't have a lot of cache, uh, then you expect uh, performance to degrade uh, relatively quickly as your array size increases, but you won't see as noticeable of drops here, or there won't be as many of them as you move through layers of the cache. Uh, on that front, there are a couple other sort of oddities here. Uh, for instance, I don't know why this like kind of back fold appears over here associated with um, there's a slightly better performance at a slightly larger sized array in both these cases. Uh, and the textbook authors, Brian and Howard, actually comment uh, that they are not unsure why this little hump exists in the Intel uh, chip, that there's some little performance bump here where things are aligning properly. Uh, my guess is if they did a, a much more rigorous sort of examination of this, they probably that hump would disappear. Uh, but they even in their little the miniature blog associated with when the textbook was released had a little blog entry about this so you can go read about it if you're so inclined. We're not probably going to get into that level of detail, uh, but suffice to say, uh, this is the source for those textbook pictures uh, that you saw uh, and uh, may be of interest to you, like as you uh, go forwards in um, uh, sort of studying uh, the memory system in its entirety. So, uh, moving on from that then, uh, the first thing we might want to talk about just a little bit is to tie this back to some of the earlier optimizations that we discussed at the architectural level. Uh, so it should be apparent from this simple little loop over here that we are repeatedly hitting the same location uh, in terms of registers, uh, the sum location. And there might actually be ways to speed that up. Uh, Brown and Halloran in their sort of benchmark actually explore this explicitly and that they come up with this little sum uh, add four function. Uh, it's not called that in their code, but in the benchmark code that I showed, uh, we can look at it in there. Uh, this requires a little bit of finesse, but the central message is to get a loop that looks more like this where each of the additions I'm gonna do goes to a separate variable. And at the end of that, I sum all of those together to get my ultimate sum. The finesse that's required here is first uh, that I cannot just add on the zeroth, one tooth, ele a threeth element here. That instead, uh, I have to add on something that's based on the stride. So in this case, uh, I would need, normally be going forwards by a stride. Uh, but up here, I'm going to pre-compute a stride of one, a stride of two, a stride of three, a stride of four. I have these little SX variables uh, that account for uh, being able to look ahead at the, the current element, one stride ahead, two strides ahead, three strides ahead. And then every iteration of this loop, I'm going to increment uh, by uh, a stride of four. The other thing uh, that I want to take care of is that I need to be careful that I don't go out of bounds and that I don't miss any elements at the end of the array. If I have a stride of four, for instance, uh, then this increment is going to go by 16s. Uh, so one uh, sort of the zeroth element, uh, and then the 16th element that'll be added here, uh, and then the 32nd element. If my array isn't evenly divisible by 16, uh, then this increment is probably going to go off the end of the array. 
typical way to do this is to just stop a little bit early uh, so that I don't miss anything, and then have a loop at the end that goes by units of one, as it were. Uh, one here is an uh, air quotes because I'm really going by uh, you stride here uh, in order to get the last few uh, elements that are inside the length of it. Add those on to the zeroth element. Uh, this is going to be a tiny loop that's limited to maybe uh, uh, zero to stride iterations, so it shouldn't comprise a large fraction of what I'm doing here, so long as the array is long. So all of that to say then, uh, this is one way that we can utilize some tricks we learned earlier that if I add to different register locations, you can enable some pipelines and superscalar features on the hardware to potentially do better in terms of optimization. Now, uh, lest you go around augmenting all your code with stuff that looks like this, uh, you should first be aware that it introduces a little bit of risk uh, that uh, up here I have to introduce a bunch of additional variables, uh, have a cleanup loop down here, forget, uh, not forget to, to add everything together. All that is sometimes overkill, or probably overkill in a lot of cases. Uh, unless you're traversing an array uh, in order, then this probably isn't sort of worth it. Instead, if you're traversing the array and uh, each of the things in there is not an integer but a pointer, then probably this isn't going to make a whit of difference. Uh, the other thing that you should be aware of is that the particular number of unrolls that we have here, and we'll come to know this technique as loop unrolling, is that instead of going by ones, I'm going by fours here, and so I'll have four additions in there. The number of times you unroll, uh, once or um, an unroll of factor of two or three or of four up to this, uh, that is somewhat dependent on the particular machine that you'd run on. Uh, that even between the machines that you measured in last week's lab, you saw that in some cases, loops that do two or three of these go faster, and in other processors, you run the same code and it doesn't go any faster. And so this kind of tuning of adding code in there uh, is really a, a gonna require some effort to figure out what is the right unrolling strategy. We'll emphasize this when we do a project and that you'll very likely be obligated to unroll, but you'll have to experiment a little bit to match the number of rolls to the specific processor that you're working on. And there's nothing for it there just uh, other than to just try a couple different unroll patterns and see which one produces the best nu uh, numerical results in terms of fastest performance, uh, best time, as it were. The final caveat uh, to all of this is that out there in the real world, probably you wouldn't bother with this. That instead, you just turn on compiler optimizations. And GCC, as an optimizing compiler, is able to do these kinds of optimizations, either as a matter of turning on a bunch of level 3 optimizations, or by making use of some other special optimization flags that you can pass to it. Uh, to illustrate that, uh, let me just come over and have a quick look at the code that is uh, encoding these two things. It's in this, uh, let's see, stride throughput uh, bit of code. Uh, instructions for running and so forth are up there, but I just want to contrast. Here's that some simple uh, function that goes, goes by stride every time and adds on. That's what we used originally to generate that two-dimensional plot. And here's the sum add for function that is more or less what Brian O'Halloran used in their um, uh, work on this. In the main function down here, I'll just have a loop uh, and it's going to go through a bunch of different strides up to some max uh, and I'll test twice. Uh, first, test the sum simple and I'll do that by uh, starting and stopping the clock and then uh, later on test the Oh, sorry, print results, and then test the add sum add four by, again, uh, doing a little bit of adding in a loop, uh, and the, from that you'll see the uh, clock over here. Uh, I am going to do this for some number of trials here, and then probably take an average of those. This gives a little bit more statistical rigor uh, to it. Uh, it's not great, uh, but it's better than nothing on that, that front. Uh, to demonstrate this, uh, let me... Come up here, I'll GCC that, um, let's see, some, let's see, uh, stride throughput. Uh, and importantly, I'm going to turn on just debug level optimizations uh, for this. Uh, and then I'll run this thing. It will ask me for what's the maximum size of the array. Uh, I'll say 100,000 to 3. Uh, and the maximum stride I want to care to look at is 30. Uh, so I'll punch this thing out and the results come out really fast. So maybe I want something a little bit bigger than that. So let's take a array of size a million. 
Uh, now we actually get uh, some, some timings on, on that. Uh, now it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see as we go through here, uh, times decreasing. So this simple one uh, is 1.12. Uh, let me turn on, there we go. I guess so you can see it. Uh, this simple one is 1.12 and then about half of that, although slightly less. Uh, you can see my throughput didn't stay the same because it took me slightly more than half the time in order to do that. Uh, so my throughput up here, uh, starting in 892, 756, 638, this is decreasing. Uh, also, interestingly then, uh, let's see. So you don't like the color of my line highlighting at the moment. Um, the uh, sort of odd lines here, the add four and so forth, uh, they use that add four and you can see this actually does take less time. Uh, so uh, in the uh, 10 to the minus third versus 10 to the minus fourth, uh, and we're winning in most cases, both in terms of the throughput and with the, um, the time, total time it takes for all these add fours. As you get uh, down here though, uh, you'll start to see those two converge just a little bit and uh, at some times they're fairly close to, to each other. So uh, 3.74 uh, for the simple, that's actually uh, slightly better than the add four version uh, down here. Uh, and so as you get bigger and bigger strides, uh, these things start to sort of uh, pan out uh, just a little bit to, to, to equalize. Now, if I recompile this, with the higher level optimizations enabled. What you'll see is that this actually squeezes a lot more performance out of that simple code. Uh, and so if I run this thing again the same way, uh, you'll see that my initial set of times up here, which were in the 10 to the minus third, uh, they're actually in 10 to the minus fourth and I'm doing better than that unrolled loop down here. Uh, this isn't uh, persistent uh, that you can see the unrolled version does better here. The simple version does here. There might be some oscillation here. And generally it's hard to sort of get reliable hardware timings on, on this kind of stuff. Uh, but we got a lot of mileage out of writing a simple loop and then asking the compiler to optimize this uh, for me. On that front, uh, we will be in a situation on the project uh, that you'll be obligated to do the unrolling yourself because we're going to use only debug level optimizations. But as you go out into the wild, it's going to be much more worth your while uh, that instead of spending a lot of time on micro optimizations like that, write clear, simple code, and then toy with the compiler optimizations as you see the need for more speed in the code. So with that discussion in under our belt here, uh, we're starting to learn some tricks about tying stuff to our earlier discussion of hardware uh, architecture in the CPU and how that can be exploited to improve uh, various aspects, uh, including uh, memory uh, sort of traversal. Uh, but importantly, we still haven't really dealt with this a fact that there's this cache here and we've only gotten around the edges of how this thing looks, uh, not dove right into what it looks like in earnest. So we'll close out our discussion with that uh, part. Caches are around because generally folks in the hardware community who design this stuff recognize that computer programmers and computer programs tend to have two aspects that can be exploited in hardware to improve performance with very little effort on the part of the coder. They just continue coding the way that you normally do and the hardware will take care of certain aspects to make them go faster. Uh, those two are temporal and spatial locality. So uh, the temporal part refers to time as in some variables and some data that you use is very likely to be used again in the near future. So if it takes a little while to get it to someplace faster, that will pay dividends because uh, the time you spend moving it to someplace fast, this piece of data that at one point you're using, that'll probably pay dividends because you're likely to use it several more times in uh, the near future. Uh, this is exemplified in the register file in that most operations uh, tend to move something out of main memory into a register and then grind on that register for a while before writing it back to main memory. The second aspect of the spatial locality uh, has to do with accessing a piece of data and then being very likely to access something that is close to it. Uh, this is exemplified in tight loops like this, where in an array, uh, you would add on element zero and very likely then in a loop like this, and the loops like this show up all over the place, you're going to access element one and element two that are close uh, to element zero in that array. 
This is exemplified in our earlier discussion of the uh, the matrix business, uh, where when we went across rows, uh, we visited things in row major order and therefore hit memory very uh, close to one another. Uh, versus going down columns, took big jumps through the array. Uh, this is going to turn out to not favor cache at all. And that was uh, underscored in a discussion of the stride, where you have better temporal or sort of better spatial locality as you're going by ones here. But if I were to change this to plus equals two or plus equals three, then I'm accessing something at one index, but then skipping some elements that are nearby. The spatial locality is worse for programs that look like that. We can artificially introduce that with strides, but in most real world applications, you're going by ones through arrays. And so it makes sense to build hardware architecture that supports uh, efficient access of array elements that are close to other array elements that are out there. So then we're in a position to talk about the memory pyramid, which essentially involves moving things from lower, larger areas that are slow up to uh, areas that are higher up in the pyramid uh, that have less space but are more likely than to benefit from this spatial and temporal locality. So generally, as a um, uh, program begins running, the stuff that's in its registers aren't much good. And so it will fetch some stuff from memory, main memory, for instance, uh, and populate parts of this cache uh, that you see that are attached to the CPU and actually part of the processor chip itself in modern systems, uh, ultimately to get one thing into one register. But pulling that one thing out of main memory will actually take a big chunk of main memory and plop it down in the L3, the L2, and the L1 cache in smaller and smaller chunks and just get that one element. That means then as you would access, for instance, the next thing in the array to pull it into that same register and overwrite it, uh, that chunk that you pull out of main memory will be resident also in the caches. And so I don't have to go all the way back to main memory, that instead I just need to make a trip usually short uh, to L1 cache, which is, aside from registers, the fastest place that the CPU can uh, access. So to that end, uh, it's important to understand the way this hierarchy uh, is shaped, uh, that up at the top are the fastest things uh, that are essentially in the CPU's brain, and they are registers, uh, but there's a very tiny capacity associated with those. Uh, as you go farther out, there are more abundant space uh, in the caches, uh, but these, as the layers would indicate, uh, get larger and slower as you work your way out. They're still very, very fast in the tens of nanoseconds to access things in the various cache layers. But once you go off the processor chip itself, and you can see this little diagram is blocked out that this whole thing is part of the CPU chip itself, uh, that you, then you're going to make a trip to somewhat more distant uh, parts of the computing platform. And that physical memory, while still fast, is an order of magnitude slower. And they're talking uh, upwards of 100 nanoseconds to access uh, parts of RAM. That's still blindingly fast compared to accessing even the fastest solid state hard drives. Uh, but generally, as you go out beyond that, you're talking uh, in the uh, thousands to millions of nanoseconds. Uh, and the older style mechanical hard drives that have spinning magnetic platters on them uh, are several orders of magnitude slower than that yet. Uh, the, these devices that are lower down here, they still serve an important purpose uh, for two reasons. Uh, first and foremost, they are uh, permanent, and everything that's at the physical memory, uh, as in DRAM uh, and above, those things are fast but uh, ephemeral, as in once you remove power from these circuits, those SRAM and DRAM uh, chips, they lose the bits that they were storing versus the solid state memory that is present in uh, newer hard drives and the magnetic memory that is present in uh, your standard mechanical hard drive, these things are permanent. That when you write bits to them, it may take longer, but when you remove power, those bits don't go anywhere so that when you power on, you still have the files that you were working on saved either in the solid state or the uh, standard mechanical hard drive. The other reason that they are important and part of this memory hierarchy is that if you run out of physical RAM in some way, you can actually make use of disk files to emulate RAM. And this is something that we'll discuss in some more detail later on when we cover the virtual memory system. 
but we'll allude to it at various parts of this case, that uh, if my system has a paltry one gigabyte of RAM, I can actually configure the operating system to say, treat some area of disk as though it were a backup for RAM. So I can pretend like I have two gigabytes, uh, gigabytes. one of those gigabytes is uh, backed up by uh, the uh, disk drive instead. This uh, is a sort of pretend in that if I'm actually trying to use all two gigabytes at the same time, uh, it will be bad for system performance because these disk files associated with swap space is slow. Uh, but we'll talk about that in some more detail uh, later on. Uh, generally then, the reason that a lot of these things uh, are faster and smaller uh, is that they're uh, more expensive, that process registers and these caches tend to be comprised of SRAM, uh, this kind of circuitry that we talked in our architecture discussion that uses a fair number of transistors and therefore occupies a fair amount of real estate on a two-dimensional uh, chip layout. Versus the DRAM chips that you use, uh, those are cheaper, uh, but because they bleed uh, voltage and charge over time, need to be refreshed. Uh, that makes them small, uh, but somewhat more cumbersome to use. You can pack a lot of them into a small physical area, uh, but uh, making them less expensive, but this bleeding aspect uh, makes for slower access times. And finally, then the permanent nature of the stuff that's in solid straight and virtual or in uh, mechanical hard drives, uh, these uh, tend to be slower yet again to access, but uh, they, you can pack a lot more uh, into the area uh, associated with them, uh, thereby reducing the cost per uh, byte uh, stored. To give a few concrete numbers, and these are just sort of a little bit vague, like not precise to any one particular system, you tend to have about zero access time in order to access a register in an instruction. So if uh, you are doing register only instructions, and these are like uh, add Q of REX and RBX, no parentheses around them, uh, then there's no performance hit here. Like you're gonna exa get exactly one cycle uh, of clock time devoted to finishing that uh, addition. Uh, the other uh, sort of more distance stuff here would involve a dereference of that, so a parenthesis around that register. And in that case, you're accessing some part of main memory that may be closer than going all the way out to main memory. If you've recently used it, then due to that favoring of spatial and temporal locality, it's probably in cache. If it's in L1 cache, uh, then you're looking at maybe a clock cycle delay, like a, a half nanosecond delay. If it's a little farther out in that uh, L2 cache that's out down here, uh, then you might be looking at several clock cycles of delay. But still nothing to worry you uh, um, um, too terribly. And if we could actually be close to each other at this point, uh, you think of these as numbers that are in your brain versus a number that you wrote down a sheet of paper, but it's the shade of paper that's right in front of you, so you just need to glance down at it to remember it. Versus uh, in the L2 cache, it's the person sitting next to you, so you kind of have to crane your neck over to look at their piece of paper to see what's on there. On the other hand, uh, if you're looking at a trip to main memory, as in that parenthetical around the register is not present in cache because maybe it's the first element of an array or the first time you're accessing this particular array, this is going to delay the processor some considerable amount, like 100 nanoseconds, uh, time in which it could have done 100 of additions if that piece of memory had already been in a register. But instead it's not, and so the processor tends to stall at that point. Uh, this isn't a big stall. It'd be like walking uh, from the back to the front of the room to look at some number that is on some person's piece of paper uh, that's uh, several rows away from you. Finally then, uh, if this is some file that has been saved to disk, and this is the first reference to it uh, that's being loaded, then you're looking at something that's just grotesque. 10 million some nanoseconds of delay. Uh, this tends to cause a program that's accessing for the first time some data in the file uh, to be delayed considerably. So much so that the operating system tends to just put it to sleep while that 10 million nanoseconds is spent retrieving the disk file, plopping it down in RAM, and uh, then finally letting the program go ahead. Uh, so your program gets put on hold so that other programs can make more effective use of the CPU uh, as they will probably be using things that are in main memory or in cache at that point. So you can do something like uh, 100,000 instructions uh, that even are hitting main memory for some other program while this disk uh, file is fired up. We'll talk about how those two things can be parallelized at a later point. Uh, but 
to, for perspective, instead of uh, being in a classroom with somebody that you have to go find, this is uh, walking to Salt Lake City and back to retrieve some piece of paper that has a number on it there that you need. Big O analysis doesn't capture uh, these effects at all. And to that end, uh, it's a sort of summary and theoretical technique that does not necessarily uh, play out all the time in practice. Uh, for instance, big O analysis predicts that linked lists are just as fast as uh, accessing the sequential elements in an array, but due to caching effects and the unpredictability about where links chase from one uh, node in a linked list to another, uh, you'll see that uh, the practical performance benefit of uh, linked lists uh, is completely nullified, uh, or sorry, the practical like utility of linked lists is completely nullified if you're just traversing elements in order, that you're almost always better off using arrays uh, for small types of data like that. Linked lists have other advantages, for instance, the ability to easily append at either end of it if you're keeping track of the right pointers. Uh, but generally, for numerical kinds of computations or you're summing stuff, you favor arrays as much as possible. To relate this to some of the chip layout and design, uh, it's time to start introducing uh, some pictures of this stuff. Uh, we talked earlier about a simple CPU design that had an ALU in it and a register file and so forth. Uh, we'll simplify those somewhat and just draw off sort of block diagrams associated with them, that the ALU is talking to the register file. But the other pieces that are involved in this uh, comprise parts of the memory system that are either on the CPU, like in this box, and that includes the cache, uh, or off CPU, that is this separate DRAM chip that you can buy. In days past, people would, in desktop systems, uh, decide they don't have enough RAM, so go to a store like Best Buy or Circuit City, God rest its uh, soul, uh, and pick up a new RAM stick that was twice as big, uh, un detach the old one, which is just pulling out that chip and plugging a new one, and suddenly you have more RAM. Uh, upgrading your cache is now impossible because this stuff is soldered directly into the CPU. You can see a layout here of an actual chip uh, that, uh, courtesy of Stack Overflow, has areas associated with cache uh, circled on it. And this is an interesting chip in that it's a multi-core chip. There are actually four independent cores here that generally comprise a set of registers and an ALU, and then some small caches, uh, the L1 and the L2 cache, which are private to each of these cores. Each of these things then could be thought of independently potentially running a program, as in Core 1 is running a, a Google Chrome instance, Core 2 is running an Atom a text editor instance, Core 3 is running a word processor, and Core 4 is running another Google Chrome tab, because that's actually an independent process. Some of them have, uh, each of them has some private cached data, but all of them are contending and sharing this L3 cache. Uh, these cache elements probably measure in total a few megabytes at most. And Intel has been expanding its cache size, particularly the L3 level, uh, in order to make programs run more efficiently. As in, you take a smaller performance hit if you have to fetch something from L3 cache versus spending 100 nanoseconds to go off of this chip entirely across the bus interface on the motherboard to the I.O. bridge, which connects uh, the CPU uh, to the main memory chips. And there, this is the source of that 100 nanosecond delay, that as I go off chip, I have to communicate with several different parties here. Uh, these buses, as they're called, are just wires that use a communication protocol for the CPU to ask, hey, fetch me what's at memory address 1024 from this memory chip over here. Uh, that's uh, uh, sort of in part to allow for this big gigabyte thing, uh, uh, sized thing to be replaced independently from the CPU. Uh, but it's also a sort of practical consideration that uh, you can't solder on enough stuff to this uh, to sort of serve as a full memory. Uh, so this protocol then that allows a memory fetch to happen, uh, it's useful in that it allows you this independent piece of memory that can change size as you want to upgrade the system. But it does cost in terms of time, that it's slower to go off chip and then get a return uh, and a total probably of 50 nanoseconds out and 50 nanoseconds back, I would niche, uh, the, at which point the CPU can't actually do anything at that point. You can also see then that if several of these cores are asking for things from main memory, you get contention along these. Uh, and so that needs to be serialized and shared in some way.
uh, to sort of tie those two together, this is a block diagram uh, that sort of describes this, where you have in each core an ALU and then a separate register file that allows them to issue uh, different uh, streams of instructions uh, that are private to them, uh, con uh, sort of associated with an independent program that's running. But they all share this unified cache and main memory. A couple things to note if you're looking carefully here, you'll see a dcache and an iCache. These relate back to our earlier uh, cache measurements using that perf tool. Dcache is short for data, and iCache is short for instructions. Generally, main memory contains the program that is being run, but as you execute instructions, uh, because you're likely in a tight loop to execute the same set of instructions over and over again, the instructions themselves follow this uh, principle of temporal and spatial locality that some portion of the program will be brought in through the caches and the instructions themselves are treated slightly separately to say here are the instructions that I'm executing or have executed in the recent past and I'm likely to execute again in the near future because loopy code uh, you always sort of uh, execute those more than once it makes sense to put them in the fastest possible area of memory uh, available. And this then uh, explains to some extent some of the pictures you saw earlier uh, associated with architecture, where we saw the ALU and the program counter uh, and the register file tied in some way to some spot that you can get instructions. That's usually a cache of them here in the modern era. We'll end our discussion today then with a quick allusion to another reason that the caches and the DRAM are these drastically different sizes. Uh, and also have drastically different uh, sort of uses in computing systems. Uh, that on the left-hand side of the bottom here is a picture of an SRAM circuit. Now, it may not be immediately apparent, but this essentially reflects uh, that two-part SR latch that we talked about, this static RAM business. I could not tell you exactly how these little transistors, that's a long bar, short bar here, how they reflect the architecture of those SR latches or flip-flops. But my guess is something like uh, there's a pair here uh, of, uh, that comprises an SR latch. Uh, that's those two, um, let's see, NOR gates, and then a pair here, or maybe it's uh, something like a reverse of that. I mean, you can see the dots here of the NOR gates. Uh, and so uh, on that front, uh, the sort of main message I want you to take away from this is just the physical dimensions of this thing. Um, and it's roughly at the same scale of our counterpart over here that we'll look at in a second, uh, that it takes me one, two, three, four, five, six transistors in order to uh, comprise one bit of static SRAM. Uh, that's one bit uh, of that uh, flip-flop that we talked about earlier with the timing di diagrams and so forth. Um, this sort of behemoth here is what I can store one bit on. Compare that to the other diagram over here where I have a single transistor over here and then this little puppy which is a capacitor. Uh, it stores charge. The combination of these two along with some circuitry to access it is all that is required to store one bit of DRAM or dynamic RAM. The static RAM here uh, is that coming off of this thing is a consistently a voltage level uh, that indicates uh, the bit, uh, whether it's uh, a high or a low. Uh, you can look at what's coming off this wire at any moment and see if there's a one or a zero stored in this thing. Contrast that uh, over here is that uh, the capacitor here can be charged up to store one, uh, but in order to read that, you need to see uh, the charge drain out of it. So this dynamic business over here is essentially uh, when I want to know whether a one or a zero is stored in this, uh, I'll turn this thing on and drain the capacitor. Uh, if some charge comes out, then a one is stored in there. But if I wait and nothing comes out, then a zero is stored in there. Importantly, that actually changes the bit that is stored in here. So attached to this has to be a bunch of circuitry that if you drain out and see a one, it actually recharges this thing. So the next time you read it, uh, it, um, it still reads a one. Uh, that volatile nature associated with dynamic RAM is part of why it's slower to read than the static RAM. As in, you can see this almost instantaneously, uh, the high or low voltage here, versus here you have to wait and then recharge. Also of some concern is that capacitors always leak a little bit. So every so often, the DRAM chip goes offline from the CPU's perspective so that all of the capacitors can be emptied out and recharged just so that you don't lose the ones that are stored in there uh, over time. All of this sort of, uh, sort of framework has led to the following trajectory in terms of cost. Uh, 
uh, that both these things were fairly well understood even back in the 80s. Uh, but improvements have been made to both of them uh, at something of an exponential rate. Unfortunately, the, um, the rate for DRAM far exceeds the rate for SRAM. Uh, so you can see going from 1985 uh, to 2010, uh, uh, several tenfold uh, uh, decrease in terms of the cost per megabyte of SRAM uh, and a several fold decrease, a uh, hundred fold here decrease uh, to the access time associated with it. Uh, on the other hand, there's a much more dramatic trajectory going from uh, the cost in terms of uh, dollars per megabyte of DRAM uh, in 1985 down to today where it's just a pittance. And this is why you get gigabytes of DRAM uh, in a standard main memory chip uh, versus only several megabytes of, D of SRAM uh, that are soldered onto the CPU. I don't know exactly uh, what the uh, sort of source of this sudden spike is in uh, SRAM complexity and uh, you can see the time has gone down but the cost has gone up. My guess is it has something to do with uh, the sharing that's required, that the additional overhead of sharing a big L3 cache across several um, um, cores probably has to do with this uh, sudden spike in cost at uh, 2015. But you can see then uh, the dollars per megabyte drop is 100 fold here uh, from 1985 to relatively now versus uh, several tens of thousands uh, of uh, orders of magnitude of drop from uh, in terms of DRAM. Uh, and so this has led to very large DRAMs and only modest sized SRAM parts and is why you tend to not see SRAM used uh, for main memory ever. Uh, it would be just in inordinately expensive at that point and probably too complex to lay out due to the large nature of the circuitry here that even if someone was willing to pay through the nose uh, for a big DRAM chip uh, or a big main memory chip comprised of SRAM, the engineering of it would just be too difficult uh, to, to lay out. So uh, this is why you see uh, the memory pyramid in the shape it is, that SRAM is used generally up here on the processor itself, uh, but DRAM comprises what, ten, what, ten, what one tends to call main memory or physical memory that, that's out there. Uh, the semantics that we'll learn earlier, or alluded to earlier, we'll go into some more detail on that generally SRAM is used to copy parts of physical memory. Uh, and the specific regime that's used to select uh, when I want something from physical memory, which other parts should I bring with it to facilitate the probable temporal and spatial locality that the program is executing, uh, exhibiting, uh, to which hunk of DRAM should I bring in to cache uh, to associate with the one value I want. That's something we'll talk about in more detail in the next session. But for now, there's enough to chew on, and I hope that you all spend a little bit of time doing some reading and some thinking uh, to start to understand uh, and deepen your knowledge of how these memory systems work. Hope to see you all in the lecture discussion on this tomorrow. Uh, until then, happy hacking.